Hi, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics. And in this video, I'll be going over my thoughts as usual on what was on this occasion a very entertaining PMQs ahead of the local elections tomorrow as Keir Starmer and Stephen Flynn appeared to enjoy themselves immensely. Uh, not so much Rishi Sunak. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel. So, this was a fun one. I might even use some clips. I don't usually use clips. Um, this was always going to be a big one for both Starmer and Sunak. Despite the begging letters going out from Conservative candidates not to punish them for the performance of their party in government, everyone knows that there is always a healthy or unhealthy, depending on your point of view, number of votes cast as a reflection of national issues. Obviously, only a small number of voters watch PMQs, either live or later, but any big guns brought to bear can end up being reported far more widely later. And both Starmer and Sunak will have been planning this PMQs well in advance. They knew it was an opportunity. You know, they knew it was the last one before polling day. They knew that um, a powerhouse performance or a really good question or answer could be useful for the campaign. You know, you clip something, get it flying around social media, hope to profit in terms of votes the next day. Starmer, at least, was able to go with his plan A, attack Sunak on the cost of living, with housing being the emphasis today. Sunak had almost certainly wanted to go with uh, his confected Sue Grey row to, uh, you know, to distract. But as I talked about in the first video today, all went tits up yesterday when they couldn't publish it because according to reports, they've breached confidentiality rules. Oh no. So Sunak was left with, uh, with his shield in tatters really. He even got off to a bad start before Starmer got to his feet. Another, there was another Labour MP, a Labour backbencher, who began by tackling Sunak on one of his lies from last week, one of his little porky pies in the mould of Boris Johnson. So Sunak had claimed, as Boris Johnson had done many times before, that the number in work was now higher than before the pandemic. Now, I said last week that this was one of those lies that Johnson kept using and it was regularly debunked as, as nonsense. The number in work remains low and it's still lower now. So Sunak had to say that he'd corrected the record and that actually it's not. He said it nearly was. Nearly is not the same as actually more in work, is it though? It's less, isn't it? Or fewer, really. So in other words, he's admitted that he was wrong to say it. Presumably that means he'll no longer be able to claim that more are now in work until it's actually true. And when it came to Starmer's questions, so he began by asking how many homeowners are paying higher mortgages as a result of Liz Truss. Sunak didn't answer the question, needs to say. Uh, now, we have said a few times that really Starmer needs to call this out more often, you know, when he doesn't answer. I wouldn't mind seeing it become a catchphrase even. The Prime Minister has yet again not answered the question. This is perhaps because he wants to keep the information from the public because the answer is blah, 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 and then give the answer. On this occasion, he did. That is what he did, so. So after pointing out that Sunak didn't answer the question, he said 850,000 people will be paying higher mortgages directly as a result of Liz Truss being allowed to pretend to be Prime Minister. You know, in his words, because the Tories use public money as a casino. So he then asked what the figure would be for people paying higher mortgages this year. So it's clear at this point, Starmer didn't care whether Sunak answered the questions or not. He was going to basically ask his questions and then answer his own questions because he knew Sunak wasn't going to ask, uh, answer them, you know, and provide his own damning answers. And sure enough, Sunak didn't answer that one either. He did say, though, that interest rates are coming down. Ooh, you little monkey. No, they're not. Interest rates not coming down. You look at a little graph, they're going up and up and up and up and up. And I think they're still expected to go up a little bit more later this year as well. But anyway, back to the original question. Starmer answered his own question by saying there'll be 935,000 people will be paying extra this year and added on to the ones who'd already been paying it from last year. That's nearly 2 million people paying higher mortgages as a result of Liz Truss's uh, interesting approach to economics. He then said that the cost of an average deposit has gone up by £9,000, and he asked how long it would take someone to save that extra up. You know, in other words, on top of the time it already saves, it costs, uh, 
takes to save a deposit. How much for the now extra 9,000 you need? Again, Sunak didn't answer. He just talked about the number of first time buyers. So Starmer then said, 9,000 pounds, ha ha ha, 9,000 pounds would take four years. They think it's funny that hope, nine thousand, four years, four years for the average saver to save 9,000 pounds. Or, or, or to put it a different way in terms the Prime Minister will understand, roughly the annual bill to heat his swimming pool. <laughs> I like this sort of patter. I like that. See, the thing is, Starmer should do that a lot more. He's not, we know he's not a natural orator. He's not, you know, but the benefit of cheekiness like this is it's a line. Anyone can deliver a line like that. He should make sure he has at least three zingers a week to throw out there, just consistently. Because they're great for showing up the Prime Minister and they're very clippable for social media campaigning when they decide they can be bothered to do that. You know, Starmer then moved on to uh, the government scrapping housing targets, something Sunak did last year to avoid a rebellion. Starmer asked why Sunak won't reverse it. Uh, Sunak said he wanted to give communities more control. And then Starmer came out with what I thought was actually his second best bit of the entire show. Uh, and this was, a, this was a good one for me. It was a fun one. He said that the only control Sunak had given councils was the power not to build houses. He pointed out that Sunak's dropped the house building targets because his own councillors didn't want to build houses and that he'd admitted to it last week. And then he said, stop blaming everyone else and just build some houses instead. Picture the scene as he explains this to a family. Mum and dad paying four grand extra on the mortgage because the Tories tanked the economy. Yeah. Yeah. Their eldest paying hundreds more in rent. Their youngest still stuck in the spare room because they need an extra £9,000 for a deposit. Yeah. Then, then along comes the Prime Minister and merrily tells them, sorry for crashing the economy, but we don't want to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> sorry I can't help you with the house building, but my councillors don't like it. Oh, and before I go, here's a massive council tax increase for your troubles. Why doesn't he stop the excuses, stop blaming everyone else, and just build some houses instead? Then on to the final question. Starmer said that uh, debt's gone up, tax has gone up, the economy's stalled. He then said the Tories are going to need a bigger note. Which is a good one. See, this is in reference to the Tories trying to make something of the joke note left by Labour in 2010 when they left office, which said there's no money left. It's a traditional joke. It's left by governments, uh, you know, in the Treasury during a, during a change of government. Conservatives have done it. It's just a traditional joke. It's only this modern form of conservative that's been dishonourable enough to try to claim it was some sort of official analysis or something. But Starmer actually using the material as the source of his main joke of the day, the one he finished off with, just proves that whatever impact the Tories were hoping to get from it, it's not worked. Greg Hans, the Tory party chair, he'd been tweeting it several times a day during the campaign. Seems to have gone a bit quiet on it now. I've seen Mark Jenkinson trying it again today. But it's like, mate, if the leader of the opposition is using that as the source of their jokes, it's not working for you. Take the hint. A desperate ploy from a party long bereft of ideas. Then Starmer finished, because of course we know what happens. Whatever Starmer says at the end, Sunat's going to come back and do what Boris Johnson pioneered effectively. The grandstand at the end, talking about whatever they want to talk about, knowing full well that whatever they say, Starmer can't get up and come back at it. So the Prime Minister has the last word. So ideally what you do is you cut the legs from under them. You sort of ask a question that they can't really refuse to answer, which Starmer did on this occasion. He finished by asking Sunak to honour the late Queen ahead of this week's coronation. Um, a smart move. Obviously, Sunak had prepared, in fact, we saw it because he tried it anyway, he'd prepared this grandstanding bit where he could say what he likes. Uh, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I'm actually going to have to answer this question, aren't I? Oh, no. <laughs> so he did and then he tried to go to his grandstanding bit but it was just so out of place because it just clearly didn't have anything to do with the question which was about the Queen completely disjointed he tried it anyway because he'd got nothing left and he knew it had been a disaster up until that point then on to Stephen Flynn of the SNP he continued to poke at Labour as well as he has done since the polls in Scotland have been in flux a bit 
So he reminded people that David Cameron persuaded Nick Clegg to drop his pledge on tuition fees before they promptly trebled them and asked if Sunak will take the credit for Starmer doing likewise. Needless to say, Sunak had no problem with this question. He actually thanked Flynn for the question, saying it's hard to keep up with Starmer's broken promises. And if you wonder why I'm smiling, it's because Starmer will not mind that at all. It was a promise broken to party members who are actually more than happy that we're going into government. And it was made in order to appeal to, to it was in order, it was made to make sure he doesn't break manifesto promises. Those are the ones the voting public will hold him to. What determines whether Labour gets into government, stay into government, is what the general public think. The promises that matter are the manifesto promises. He's making sure he doesn't break those. Then Flynn said that Westminster parties don't offer young people any hope. Sunak said that people from disadvantaged backgrounds are more likely to go to university in England than in Scotland. I did think to myself, hang on, we we'll have to check that one out. Uh, that, that seems a bit doubtful to me. Scottish students don't pay tuition fees at Scottish universities. And also, Scotland has more deprived areas in general. And Sunak has been known to tell the odd fib. I mean, he started PMQs admitting to a little bit of a fib last week. And I have to say, I'd, getting hold of the raw figures and making sure they're comparable wasn't easy from my little Google search. I spent about 20 minutes. Uh, but what I will say is this, in terms of, I could only find process data, I'm afraid. According to the Scottish government, 16.7% of students at Scottish universities came from disadvantaged backgrounds. This is an increase in what it was before, but it's 225 for the whole of the UK. So that would actually suggest that Sunak's correct. Although it could well be, and this is why I would want the raw figures and how it's measured, it's possible that they're measuring disadvantage differently, that, that Scotland has a, a harsher measure for it, I don't know. It, the perils of comparing stats from two different authorities. I would certainly be surprised if it's true though. Not only does Scotland have more deprived areas, like I say, uh, its education system is generally regarded as being very good in fact, but certainly better than that uh, in England and Wales. Tuition fees are free for Scottish students if they study in Scotland. So it's all there for students from disadvantaged backgrounds to have easier access to higher education in Scotland. But the stats would seem to back Sunak up. So, you know, I can't call out a lie there, um, even if the, the stats are not directly comparable for whatever reason. But there we go. That was a fun PMQs. Uh, both Starmer and Flynn will have been very happy with all that. I'm not sure Sunak will have enjoyed it. Uh, but there we are. Those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. Hope you found the video interesting. If you did, please click the like button. If you'd like to support the channel further, the join button for memberships. And until next time, I'll see you later.